All right. Um, this is a Kemp Oral History Project interview for the Jack Kemp Foundation with William Ill L. Billy Shaw, former Buffalo Bills football player. We are in his home, located uh, outside Toccoa, Georgia. Today is Wednesday, August 17th, 2011, and I'm Brian Williams. Let's start with this, uh, Billy. What thoughts first come to mind when I say Jack Kemp? Intelligence. Um, you know, often there, there, there are a lot of characteristics that would uh, define Jack. But um, I'm often asked, you know, about Jack, and I have to uh, I have to answer that Jack was probably one of the more intelligent people that I'd ever been around. Um, doesn't matter, you know, uh, what we were talking about or uh, where we were going with that conversation, but you. You knew immediately that uh, Jack was uh, had some special gifts uh, when it came to uh, the intelligent side of our character. Do you want to name some of those gifts? Uh, his vocabulary. Uh, he worked on you know constantly, uh, and I think it uh, was a uh, game from time to time. He come up with words and he even did it in a huddle. I can't remember I can't remember the the you know the terminologies that he would use but we would laugh from time to time as some of the things that he would say, you know, in the huddle, knowing that it was a, a joke, but he had practiced a word somewhere along the line uh, to spring on us. But uh, Day to day, Jack uh, was able to communicate in a way that uh, was uh, refreshing but different. Can you remember any of the words that came up? I can't up in that? even pronounce the words. Must less try to spell the words that you know that he would use. Um, all of us made fun, you know, of uh, of Jack and 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 his words which just actually uh, gave him the fire and the fuel to, to do more. You asked me to name some of the words, I couldn't name them if I had to because they go in one ear and out the other, but uh, he had a vocabulary. What do you think his motivation was in, in doing that? Uh, I think that, uh, that, that Jack you know, was probably practicing <laughs> somewhere along the way. But uh, it, it, it was, I'm not so sure it was a game. Jack, um, and, and we, we made fun of him, you know, because he used uh, so many big words that we knew, didn't know the definition to, uh, much less we couldn't say them but, uh, or pronounce them. Uh, but uh, we accused Jack of uh, going to the dictionary and picking out words for that day. And uh, I don't know if that was fair or not, cause, because uh, Jack had command of our, of our language and he actually, you know, those were not everyday words because he's talking to a bunch of football players, but uh, Jack had command of, of, um, of his vocabulary anyway. How did he manage to do that and at the same time um, maintain the respect and, and so forth of the team? Why didn't he begin to be perceived as an egghead or, or, or a, an intellectual and therefore not a he-man football player? Well, uh, the proof in the pudding is what you bring on Sundays, you know, at the game. And uh, Jack had uh, uh, way above average, uh, um, you know, playing skills. Uh, he was not a, uh, an extremely big guy, but uh, he was a very tough, uh, you know, individual. 
and uh, he uh, he had the physical skills to go along with his mental skills. So uh, nobody ever doubted, you know, that uh, you know his ability to play the game, and we put all our trust in him. You know, we just put up with some of the stuff <laughs> to make sure that he did his job. Uh, other gifts come to mind? Uh, Jack never met a stranger. You know, he had the ability to uh, communicate with people. He had tremendous communication skills. Um, those... Uh, those skills along with the intelligence, you know, that he had. And um, he could draw, he could draw on, on his characteristics like that, you know, immediately when he needed to. Um, he did that on the football field. Um, you know, he would see a defense out there that was uh, not common and he knew immediately what plays to, you know, to switch to. And, um, you know, I, that was kind of the way I perceived him, you know, as a politician. He was quick on his feet. Um, you know, he, he always knew, um, and this is my perception, he always knew the right answer. And that that doesn't come uh, to a person that uh, that's not ready, uh, you know, for you know whatever situation might come up. And uh, Jack was always ready, on the field and off the field. I I don't mean to be pushing you too far here, but any other gifts that come to mind? Um, I'm you know Jack had a a very broad um, um, character. Um, you know, the meeting people, the being able to communicate uh, his um, uh, characteristics as an athlete. Um, you know, he was quick. Uh, he was very strong. Uh, I mentioned that he was very tough. Um, you know, as as we start talking about individuals and what make up individuals, um, I, we've already probably looked at some of the more important characteristics, you know, in a person. Um, for me, the thing that I liked about Jack the probably the most is that he um, he had tremendous faith and he practiced his faith, um, his, um, his ability to, uh, communicate, uh, without, uh, vulgar language, his, um, you know, his ability to be consistent in his everyday life, um, was something that, uh, a lot of, a lot of us, including myself, you know, looked up to. So if you, you say push. If you push me to, uh, to, to go to the depth of what I thought made up Jack Kemp, um, it wouldn't be his intelligence, although he was, as I said, probably the most intelligent person I ever had been around. It would be his faith in the way that, uh, that he communicated that. I was going to come to that subject a little later, but let's deal with it right now. How did he practice his faith and uh, talk about it a little bit? Well, um, you know, he, he didn't knock you down with it. Um, you know, I don't know that, that I ever saw him um, talk about salvation part of the faith. Uh, that was uh, somewhat private to, to him. But the life that he lived, um, you know, the clean language, uh, uh, I don't know that I ever saw alcohol, you know, um, uh, consumed by, by Jack. Um, 
the way he treated people. He was, uh, you know, that he had, you know, he was special. Um, the faith, you know, you can go many different ways with that. But I think that, uh, you know, Jack's uh, ability to um, be consistent in his everyday life. Uh, he was a tremendous father. He was a tremendous husband. Um, he was kind to people. Uh, and that's what I remember the most about my friend. So I think what you're saying is that he lived a Christian life, but he didn't impose a Christian life on others. That's that what I'm saying. Exactly. Um, you knew that he was different. Uh, you knew that he was special. And um, uh, when I said that I never had seen him, uh, you know, communicate to an individual, you know, you're doing, you're doing this in life when you should be going in this path in life. Never saw him do that. But he led by example and he would lead you in that direction and whether you knew you were headed in that direction or not. And you know, that's the important thing about, you know, about Jack. Jack was a very influential person and he knew that. And he was um, uh, very consistent about how, you know, he molded a young players or an older guy, how he, you know, how he presented himself to that person. Um, I don't think you will find anybody that uh, played with or knew Jack uh, that um, would have anything negative you know, to say about uh, Jack in his personal life. He was active in a Christian athletes group. Were, were, well, know? I don't I don't know if Jack was, um, you know, with uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, uh, FCA, or, uh, you know, some of the, uh, some of the other groups, but um, um, it wouldn't surprise me, you know, back during our playing day when I would see Jack every day, uh, you know, we, we, we weren't uh, hands-on involved. Uh, we did a lot of speaking, you know, to, uh, to events. In fact, I got, uh, I got my first uh, speaking engagement because of Jack. He wanted a hundred dollars, and they didn't have but fifty dollars, and I was—I uh, would have gone for twenty-five dollars. So, all, all the ones that Jack, uh, you know, had to turn down, eventually came my way. So I made sure that he stayed up here, so I could just kind of climb up a little bit. But uh, most of that was with young people, uh, where where faith was involved, and where, you know, you, you talk about uh, character and how you get from, you know, this level to this level. And, um, you know, I learned a lot from Jack. Were you making those types of ski, uh, speaking engagements in Buffalo or elsewhere? Or? Well, certainly uh, in Buffalo, uh, we made, uh, you know, the Bills, the Bills had, uh, had a program back in the early years, uh, our days off. Uh, which was Monday, was uh, Community Day. And um, uh, it was not mandatory. It was uh, a volunt volunteer uh, program. But uh, Jack was involved. And everybody wanted Jack. And uh, so when Jack couldn't go somewhere, uh, then, you know, the second, uh, the second tier people you know, moved up. So I would always uh, try to find out where Jack was going uh, so that I could be in line for the ones that he turned down and uh, couldn't go to. But yeah, we did, a, we did a lot of, I volunteered for schools and uh, where some of the guys volunteered for hospitals or, um, 
nursing homes, uh, you know, those, uh, those type things. Jack did a lot of the political side, uh, you know, where he would go to little towns in and around Buffalo and, uh, you know, um, be involved in town meetings and that kind of thing where his expertise was, uh, uh, was known. Uh, I did schools and uh, enjoyed uh, uh, speaking to PTAs and, you know, that kind of thing. And just briefly, your topics would mostly be what? Well, let me tell you a quick story if you have time. Uh, I got in the mail a year ago a picture. Uh, the picture was taken in Lockport, New York, south of Buffalo, at a PTA meeting where I spoke to the kids and the parents. And um, a picture was taken at that PTA meeting where I talked about what it took to play the game, what it took to be a student, the involvement with mom and dad, uh, how important that was. So that was kind of the meat of uh, that particular meeting that night. This took place in 1965, where this picture was taken. And this picture came to me in 2010. And, uh, and I took a picture with a little boy that was uh, uh, seven, and a little boy that was five, and the mother of the two little boys. And um, the picture, I signed it, and that was all I was asked to do. I signed the picture, mailed it back. Then I get a phone call from the five-year-old boy in that picture. He is the athletic director at Urbana University in Urbana, Ohio. And he asked me if I will come to Urbana and speak to their all sports banquet. So I do. And that was just a few months ago. And um, uh, May of 2011. At that banquet was the other brother in the picture. And we take a picture similar to the one we took in 65. And uh, now uh, one of them's 50 and one of them's 52. But also at that banquet was the mother that was in that picture. And uh, it, was, uh, it was neat how things just, um, you know, you asked me what the topic was and both could tell me almost word for word what was said 50 years ago. So you never know how much influence you have. And Jack was a master at that kind of thing. Um, he was uh, so fluent and elegant in, his, in, in the way he presented himself. People remembered that, but they also remembered you know, what he, you know, what his topic was and what he had to say, where this is one example of something that happened for me. Um, you know, it happened numerous times, you know, for Jack. We go, we go back to Buffalo every year in September for a reunion. And there will be two, three, four, incidences uh, during that week where some stranger, you know, will come up and the conversation will be uh, what uh, Jack might have said at some banquet when he was a kid or something in Jack's later life that was an influence on, you know, on that. We hear that all the time. But it makes you feel good. What were Jack's topics? Well, um, Jack um, Jack was big on character, 
just like his life. Jack was big on character. Um, he uh, he was partial to uh, uh, to the quarterbacks, and uh, he would give them um, you know advice as to how to throw the football and you know to get strong and and um, uh, study hard and you know know the playbook and be the leader on the field that kind of thing when he was talking uh, to uh, a, a sports group um, never had never was with him uh, a great deal uh, when we were you know when we were doing those kind of things because you know where he couldn't go I got to go so we never did any I can never remember doing any together uh, maybe other than a question and answer type uh, type thing at at a banquet, uh, but Jack's topics were were really dealing with the growth of the of the young person that uh, that he was talking to. Do you have any idea who created the Monday public service concept at Buffalo? No, it was just, that was just kind of a, you know when I got there. Of course, uh, I got there in '61. Uh, Jack got there in '62, so the team was only one year old when I got there, and uh, two years old when Jack uh, got there. So um, I don't know where that came out. I just kind of said, "Well, this is part of the deal," you know. But I enjoyed that, and 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 you know, obviously he was uh, he was in demand, you know, everywhere. So it wouldn't be correct to attribute it necessarily to Ralph Wilson or to uh, Buster Ramsey? Well, uh, certainly not Buster Ramsey, uh, but, um, and, and Mr. Wilson probably, you know, didn't do it. Uh, um, I don't know where it came from, to be honest with you, but we enjoy it. Let's, uh, let's start talking about uh, Buffalo Bills football and whatnot, but before we do, just briefly tell me about uh, your playing both ways at Georgia Tech and uh, why you had to do that. Well, back in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, just because Billy Shaw played uh, offensive tackle and defensive tackle and played both ways, that doesn't make him a hero because back in those days, the rule was um, that when you started a quarter, you had to finish the quarter, meaning that if you were taken out, you couldn't go back in. So to stay, if you were an offensive player and um, you were uh, important to the offensive side of the ball, they couldn't take you out they had to play your own defense. So you played both ways. And it was all because of the crazy rule that existed. I know it existed in 58 and 59 and 60 because that's when I was uh, uh, in college uh, playing playing college football. So uh, that's the reason we went both ways. Now, it did uh, several things for you. It, it gave the pros a look at you on both sides of the football. And back in the early, early days of uh, the AFL, we only had 33-man teams. So as an offensive guard, I was a backup defensive end. And there were isolated times where I got in on the defensive side of the football only because of an injury or something. And I certainly didn't stay there very long. But um, that, uh, that's how it came about, you know, in the college side. Just to clarify, you couldn't come back in within that quarter. Within that quarter. You could return. But you could start the second quarter. It was crazy. It was a crazy rule. I remember my, my, my good friend, uh, Pat Dye, at the University of Georgia. I went to Georgia Tech. and. Oh, you know, there's there's no 
Uh, there's just bad blood between Georgia Tech and Georgia. It's quite a rivalry. And Pat was a tremendous defensive linebacker. But he only weighed about 195 pounds, and he had to play offensive guard, you know, uh, at 195 pounds on the college level. Now, he was fast as, you know, as... uh, uh, all get out and and so to lead sweeps he he got, but when it came down to the you know nose to nose uh sometimes it was a detriment uh, to a really good player uh being uh, being small but being a defensive player tell the story then of your entrance into the AFL my entrance into the AFL Um, I was drafted uh, number two by the uh, Buffalo Bills. Only eight teams. Uh, So I was the ninth, tenth, eleventh player picked in the AFL 1961. Um, I went to my college coach, uh, Bobby Dodd and uh, ask him uh, for advice. And uh, he told me, he says, uh, and, then me, and, and before I go that far, I had had contact with the Dallas Cowboys in the NFL. Um, and they wanted me to play linebacker. I never played linebacker in my life. Um, but they had seen uh, what the good Lord had blessed me with as far as foot foot speed was concerned, and they felt like I could play an outside linebacker position. So I'll go to Coach Dodd, and I'm drafted. The Bills have made me an offer, and I go to Coach Dodd, and I, I present all the facts to him. Here's what the Bills did. This is their offer. The Cowboys have called. They want to draft me as a linebacker. What should I do? And Coach Dodd in 1961 says, there is a place in professional football for a new league. You can sign with the Buffalo Bills and be a part of history when the leagues merge because they very well might merge or they might go their separate ways and the AFL will get stronger and stronger and stronger. And uh, so I signed with the Bills. And Dallas, and that was before the NFL draft, and the NFL, the Cowboys, go ahead and draft me anyway. 14th round, 184th person picked. But they had my rights at the AFL folded. But Coach Dodd was Johnny on the spot. I mean, he was he was uh, he was a special person. Other than Coach Dodd, who else was advising you? I mean, this was before the days of agents. Uh, nobody. My wife. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody was advising us. You know, we. Uh, gosh, I don't know if I talked to anybody else other than uh, you know Coach Dodd. Uh, you know, about uh, pro football. He, uh, um, I didn't. I didn't talk to anybody else. You know, that first contract um, was more money than I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, it was a uh, $11,000 uh, contract, no cut, which means that I was guaranteed that. A uh, $5,000 bonus and a uh, 1960 Bonneville Pontiac. Now, you're talking about the richest guy on Georgia Tech campus? That was me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> characterize your first uh, season with Buffalo. The team went 6-8, and eight, I believe. What was it like? Uh, <clears throat> it was different. Um, Buster Ramsey was a different coach, um, black and white 
compared to Bobby Dot. Um, totally different. Um, demeanor was different. Approach was different. Language was different. Um, this was pro football. This wasn't, uh, you know, college or high school stuff. This was the real thing. And uh, that first year was very difficult because, uh, gosh, we uh, the facilities, we didn't have any facilities. Uh, we practiced uh, uh, at East Aurora, New York uh, High School, or that's where we dressed. Uh, we, we practiced on the polo grounds uh, outside of uh, East Aurora, uh, which was not very smooth. Uh, we stayed at the Roy Croft Inn uh, in East Aurora. Uh, there were bunk beds and a room that probably slept uh, 40 people, something like that. Um, so, you know, it was totally different. Here was the league just trying to make itself uh, known. So the things that people take for granted uh, weren't there. Uh, on the field, we were, uh, we were competitive. Uh, I think we were six and eight. Uh, that was about what they were the year before in their very first year. Um, so they were, uh, there were some rookies uh, that year that um, that made the Bills team. Stu Barber, Al B. Miller, um, myself uh, were uh, were rookies that came in together. We ended up playing center, guard, and tackle for nine years. You know, next to each other. So you have to think that the success that we had later on, you know, kind of started there with, uh, you know, the development of the offensive line that stayed together for that period of time. We came in together and we left together. Uh, Jack came to us in 62. Um, didn't, didn't play, he might have played a little bit at the end of 62. But we were in the playoff game in 63, got beat, won it in 64 and 65, and got beat in 66. So uh, that, was, um, that was the beginning of the Bills' um, dominance of the AFL for a short period of time. Um, you know, the character came in 64 and uh, 62 and Cookie Gilchrist. And uh, that was a period of time that was uh, the parts of the puzzle were getting to be put together. The internet lists five men who played quarterback <laughs> in 61. In 61. Right. Well. Johnny Green, Tommy, okay. Tommy O'Connell, Richie Lucas, well, I guess only four, and Bob Broadhead. Uh, don't remember Broadhead playing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just read the wrong. It was Johnny Green, Warren Rabb, M.C. Reynolds, uh, Richie Lucas, and Tommy O'Connell. Yeah, I'll agree to every one of those. Uh, M.C. Reynolds uh, did. Probably uh, uh, Richie Lucas got hurt. Richie Lucas was a starter. He was the Bills' number one draft choice of all time. He was drafted in 1960, and he quarterbacked them in 60. And then in 1961, he started. He was a starting quarterback. Uh, he got his leg broken in uh, a game in uh, Houston, so that ended his career. And then. Um, Tommy O'Connell was a uh, coach, a quarterback coach, and he put on the pads, and um, he uh, <laughs> he played quarterback for a few games. Um, 
it doesn't seem like that Warren came until um, 62, but he might have come in 61. Um, but Warren was a good quarterback. And he was the quarterback when Jack came. And he's the quarterback that Jack had to beat out. And uh, Warren, was, uh, Warren was a good quarterback. John, uh, Johnny Green played quarterback in, in 60 and 61. He was a backup to uh, Richie Lucas. Um, those are the ones that, uh, you know, that I remember. Um, why was Ramsey fired, and what was it like, the transition then to Lou Saban? I don't know if I know the answer this many years later. Um, Buster was um, um, Buster was a tough coach. Um, Buster did not have a uh, a lot of uh, uh, personal skills, personnel skills in in handling uh, the public. Um, Everything was black and white. There was no in between with Buster. Um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it because he was a uh, an offensive guard in his uh, day. The second or third day at practice, uh, he uh, he had. Well, let me go back. We were at the college all-star game. Art Baker, the fullback, Stu Barber, who was a linebacker first, and myself were in Chicago at the uh, college all-star game. We got into Buffalo. The ball game in Chicago was played on a Friday night. We got into Buffalo on Saturday morning, put our stuff on a bus, drove to Hamilton, uh, on Ontario, Canada, and played Hamilton an exhibition game on Saturday night. I started and played every play, did not know a play. But Stu started and played every play at linebacker. Art started and played every play at fullback, and we didn't... You know, we had been told the plays from Buffalo to Hamilton. So we had some concept of what was going on. Buster did that on purpose, I'm sure. He was mad because we spent two weeks at the college all-star game and weren't in camp. And we were the high draft choices, you know, of, of that particular year. So that's the kind of guy Buster was. But um, being an offensive player, being an offensive guard, and um, um, I remember the third or fourth day at practice, um, he had me, or the play was I was pulling right and blocking the defensive end. He didn't like the way that I did it. And he became the defensive end with no pad zone. So I pull. He says pull and hit me. He didn't. He didn't think I put you know effort into it. So I pull and and go to Buster and he's standing there with no pads on. So I I go through the motions. He goes berserk. You know, just absolutely goes berserk because I didn't hit him. And uh, so we're going to do it again. So this time I put everything I got into it. I don't remember if I knock him down and I'd hope I did because he didn't have any pads on. But uh, from that time on, I, you know, I said, you know, this, he's got his heart right. You know, um, the 60, 60 and 61 were not real good years. He did not get along well with, uh, with the public and uh, didn't communicate well with the media. So, uh, But I visited him for years, uh, you know, when uh, he moved back to uh, Tennessee. And 
I liked him. Now, you, you, to carry that on further, you ask about uh, Lou. Uh, Lou and I got along extremely well. Uh, Lou was kind of Jack in a way. Uh, Lou was uh, certainly no dummy. A very intelligent person. And uh, he understood, you know, some of, some of Jack from, you know, his, his intelligent side. He was an interpreter, narrator or interpreter, um, you know, during one of the wars. And uh, he spoke uh, uh, some languages, uh, foreign languages uh, fluently and um, was uh, an interpreter. Uh, so he, he was a smart guy. Uh, Lou was very intelligent and um, understood people. Uh, he knew that my character was different from Jack's character. My makeup was different from somebody else's. And he made sure that he knew what turned you on. And... Um, uh, I liked him for that. How did the game plan change? Uh, from Lou's era versus Busta's era? Well, Lou started getting the athletes. Um, Buster didn't have the quality of athlete that Lou had. Uh, so there was a major difference there. You had Jack at quarterback. You had Cookie Gilchrist at fullback, who was, and still I say today, the best football player that I ever saw or were around was Cookie Gilchrist. Not the best athlete. O.J. Simpson was the best athlete, but Cookie was the best football player. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal football player. Um, we, uh, we had, uh, the receiving crew. We had, uh, Glenn Bass and Ernie Warlick and, uh, Elbert DeBinion. Now, Elbert was on Buster's teams in the sixties, but, 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 um, uh, Doobie was scared to death of Buster and Lou saw that and, you know, he, he made, he made friends with, uh, with Doobie, got Doobie's confidence, and um, Albert, De Albert Doobie DeBinion, you know, became a leader in the AFL uh, as a receiver just because of the way that, uh, that Lou uh, uh, handled him. Um. Let's move on to 63 then um, okay. and explain to me why a man by the name of Daryl LaMonica suddenly arrived on the scene. Well, um, I don't know why they drafted him. Um, you know, um, Jack, was, uh, Jack was quarterback. Uh, there were not, uh, we, you know, I don't even know who Jack's backup uh, was in 62, but Jack didn't play a lot at the end of 62. Um, Daryl was drafted, um, have nothing to do with Jack. You know, the philosophy in, in with a lot of professional football teams, even back as far as 63, um, you know, Jack uh, or 64, uh, Daryl was drafted in 64, not 63, right? Um, let me just check that. No, he came in 63. Yeah. He did come in 63. Okay. Um, you, you, you draft a person, not necessarily by the position, uh, when it's your time, you look at the best athlete. And usually that person can be a help, you know, to you. Um, you know, Jack came to us as an injured quarterback. Um, was he going to be our quarterback for six or eight or 10 years? Nobody knew that. 
So it was, uh, I'm sure that Darrell was drafted by the Bills, you know, as a um, um, insurance, you know, to the quarterback position, not necessarily to Jack. Um, but that's probably the reason that, that Darrell was drafted. It's interesting, though, that there were two big passers known for their passing in Jack Kemp and Daryl LaMonica on a team that was really run-oriented. Wasn't that Lou Saban's major philosophy, to run the ball? Well, yeah, because uh, we had Cookie <laughs> and we had Ray Carlton. I, I don't mean to demise uh, Ray in any, in any way, but uh, we had two big running backs and... Um, we had uh, we had an offensive line that was very mobile, and we did a lot of sweeps and a lot of long traps and we, yeah yeah we did run the ball, but um, uh, that does not um, demean in any way the ability that Jack um, had in you know in throwing the football. Um, Darrell, you know, Darrell got into games um, uh, with um, injury primarily, you know, to uh, to Jack. I was surprised that uh, over the time they were both on the team, Jack started 39 games and LaMonica started three. Uh-huh. Uh, Jack was... the the quarterback. Jack was the starting quarterback. Now, that doesn't tell you that games that Jack started that Daryl came into. And um, Daryl, if Jack were alive, he would shoot me dead right now for what I'm about to say. Daryl was probably a better passer long passer um, uh, than, than, than Jack was. Um, but Jack uh, was um, uh, as good as they come at knowing when to throw the football and who to throw the football to. And that's, the, you know, that's the big difference. Um, but they did split. They did split some time in 60, uh, 63 and sixty four, and of course Jack was MVP of the league in sixty five. What about fan reaction to these two men? Um, it, you know, that was a long time ago, and and I I I forget, you know the. Um, uh, the plays and exactly you know how it, how it came about, but um, uh, Daryl um, Daryl got a lot of uh, uh, fan appreciation, you know when he came in. Um, Daryl uh, uh, had some success, you know, in throwing the long ball and bringing us out of a game when it looked like we were down. And, uh, you know, when Jack would uh, throw an interception, uh, if Darrell came in and didn't throw an interception, you know, then the ovation was uh, strong for Darrell and there were boos for Jack. And, uh, you know, that's just, that's just the way it was, you know, in, uh, in Buffalo. You had remarked somewhere that you thought maybe uh, Daryl was actually the fans' favorite. I, you know, he just judging from the uh, um, the reaction at uh, you know at a game from here and there, uh, it would lead you to believe that. But uh, La Monica in uh, Buffalo, New York, was more appealing than Kemp <laughs> in Buffalo, New York. Uh, a lot of uh, Italian 
uh, you know, people loved uh, uh, Darrell. And, uh, and rightfully so. He was a good quarterback. And it really showed what, you know, what, um, what his career was going to be like when uh, he was traded from Buffalo, 66. To, to Oakland. To yeah. Oakland in 66, I think. I think it was the end, yeah, at the end of the 65 season. I think. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, Jack was the uh, MVP of the league in 65, and so you got talent. The Bills recognized that and sent him off. So take yourself back to uh, taking your stance at the line uh, for a play and Jack Kemp is behind you versus Daryl LaMonica. Any difference in your feelings at the time? I can't say that there was. Um, um, I, you know, if, if there was any, and we're at the line of scrimmage and, you know, there's going to be a check off. Uh, I know immediately if Jack's in there that it is the absolute right play. I know that. So there's that confidence. Not that Daryl lacked the intelligence, it's lacked the experience. And... Um, so if there, you know, if there was a difference, you know, we have a, a ton of trust in whatever Jack was going to call, you know, at the line of scrimmage. Uh, again, not that we didn't have the trust in Daryl. It was just that uh, he hadn't, you know, he hadn't, he was still wet behind the ears. And, and you thought about that. Why was Cookie let go at the end of the 64 season? Who was behind that? Cookie, probably. Um, I just mentioned that he was the best football player I ever played with or ever saw. Uh, he was also one of the most difficult, you know, to get along with. Um, Jack. Um, gets all the credit, and deservedly so, in dealing with uh, Cookie, you know, during those difficult years that Cookie was there. Uh, but I was the captain of the team. And um, I can tell you that uh, my conversations with Lou uh, during that period of time with uh, Cookie was most difficult because Lou was a no-nonsense no type person and uh, Cookie was uh, just different. And his philosophy of life, you know, was, uh, was different. Uh, you know, the, the big incident that, that Jack did help solve um, was, um, and Cookie had, Cookie had a lot of respect for, for Jack, a lot of respect for Jack. And, uh, you know, Cookie um, didn't think that the play calling benefited him because we were throwing the football. And uh, he, you know, he refuses to go into the game. And Lou, suspends him and we need him. We need Cookie really bad, regardless of, you know, how different, you know, he was. And um, he was just a different, um, you know, different guy in the way that, that his thought process. But boy, when he walked on the football field, he was, uh, he was, a, he was a real deal. Talk a little bit more about the Kemp-Gilchrist uh, relationship. Uh, I think that Cookie, you know, Cookie probably blamed Jack for the um, um, times that he didn't get the ball when he thought he should get the ball. Um, but Jack was looking at the big picture and what was best, uh, you know, for the team, not for Cookie. 
but Cookie wanted the ball every time the ball was centered. And he was physically prepared to run the football every time it was centered. We knew that, he knew that, but that's just not the way the game works. And um, so the, the, the differences that, um, that Jack and Cookie had were over play calling. And um, um, Cookie had a tremendous amount of respect for Jack and the intelligence that Jack had, you know, for the game. Deep down, Cookie wanted to win. But Cookie thought we could win with him carrying the football every time. And Jack saw it completely different, obviously. And um, uh, that, was, uh, that was the only time that they really had, you know, differences. But the flip side of that is that, um, that deep down Cookie, Cookie knew where Jack was coming from. And... Um, uh, when Jack told, this is an old Southern saying, when Jack told you that the cow ate the cabbage, you know, there's no cabbage left. And, and that's the way Cookie looked at him, um, that, um, that he knew what he was talking about. And deep down, what Jack said was right. And you always go back, you know, to that parable. So would you characterize their relationship as close? Respectful for one another. Uh, close, no. Close definition for me is when you you spend a whole lot of time together outside uh, whatever the main activity is that brings you together. That didn't happen. Did uh, Cookie have any close associates on the team? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I I think. Uh, uh, Booker Edgerson was as close to Cookie as uh, as anybody, and stayed that way up until Cookie's death. Um, so, uh, yeah, he, he had a few. I don't know who they were out outside of the team, but uh, you know there were people that uh, that he associated with outside the team. You mentioned you were captain. Mm -hmm. You weren't co-captain. Well, yes, I was co-captain. Uh, Tom Sestak, they called us, they didn't call us, well, in one of the pictures it does say co-captain, but offensive captain, defensive captain is, is the way it looks like. You know. But you have said that uh, Jack was really the leader. Jack was the leader. Absolutely. So how did you work out being captain and his being leader? And was that troublesome at times? I didn't have a trouble with it. He might have had a problem with it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. We, uh, you know, the, the, the captain duty back in that day was um, um, you were more of a go-between between the coach the head coach, and the team. And in my particular case, it was strictly, you know, the offensive side of, of the, you know, of the team. And um, I had a great relationship with Lou. I had a really good relationship with the team. And so it was a natural fit, you know, to be able to communicate between the two. Uh, Jack's Jack's abilities, um, you know, to the team were, um, uh, had more depth than what the captain's duties were, you know, at the time. Uh, Jack did not want to demean himself to step down to be the captain. Jack was the leader. Now, if Jack had an issue with Lou Saban, would he take it to you to pass on or would he go to the coach himself? Uh, we'd talk about it. We would talk about it. Jack, uh, Jack had very few of those because um, there were there were times, probably uh, numerous times, 
that um, the play that came in to the huddle, um, Jack might alter that play, <laughs> uh, you know, at the line of scrimmage. And, um, you know, take the consequences when he went to the bench. But uh, more times than not, they, uh, they worked for us. <laughs> I'm going to pause here just for a moment. We haven't talked about race as an issue yet, um, and I'd like to hear your observations on that, and in particular about the All-Star game in 65. Okay. Um, never had a problem uh, with race. Uh, I felt uh, suspect from time to time having been uh, born and raised in uh, Mississippi, uh, particularly during the uh, integration years. But uh, being elected uh, co-captain, offensive captain of the Bills in 1962, and uh, having, you know, that responsibility up until being injured in 67 and then doing it again in the last two years of my career. Uh, that was not an issue. Uh, just never been an issue with, uh, with my family. And uh, the, 60, the 65 uh, All-Star Game uh, was uh, one in which we were in New Orleans, and it was it w it was not really an All Star game. It was the All Stars playing the Buffalo Bills, which had never been done before, and uh, we were league champions, and they picked an All Star team to play us. Did so, that did that happen only once? That's it. That was it. A real anomaly. Yeah, that was it. And uh, we were in New Orleans, and um, we had played exhibition games, you know, in the Deep South prior to, you know, that 65 All-Star game. And um, where uh, I remember uh, Mobile. We played an exhibition game in Mobile, um... 62, 63, somewhere along in there. And, um, you know, the black guys uh, stayed at a separate hotel uh, from the white guys and during, during that time. So it was nothing new. Um, but in this particular case, the guys could not get rides. Uh, the the cabs would not pick them up, and um, you know it was it was an issue. Now, two years doesn't sound like a long period of time, but from the time that we had done an exhibition game there in the early sixties to sixty five, a lot had gone under the bridge, you know, during that period of time, and uh, the guys made a stand which all of us supported. And uh, we moved the game, or they moved the game from New Orleans uh, to Houston. And um, uh, Jack, uh, Cookie, of course, Cookie was, Cookie was one of those athletes, uh, black athletes, that, um, you know, could not, uh, get the cab ride was uh, denied entrance into some of the clubs on uh, Bourbon Street, French Quarters, and um, you know Jack supported him, and uh, along with, uh, as far as I know, every other player there uh, that. Um, uh, every white player supported the, the black player. And, uh, you know, we moved it. As co-captain, did you take any particular role in that? I did not. 
I did not. Um, it, it happened quick. Um, it had a, a, you know, it kind of had an all-star um, because everybody, you know, was there. It just not the Bills. You know, the guys were mixing it up together. So it, it didn't have a Buffalo Bills, um, you know, prominence. It was an uh, all-star prominence. Uh, but Jack was one of the leaders that, that actually got that game moved. Did the all-stars play a role in that, or did they just sort sure. of stamp? They did. Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. It, it, that wasn't a Buffalo thing. No, that was not a Buffalo thing at all. So, um, in 1965, at the end of the season, Lou Saban departs for the University of Maryland. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Uh, Lou never stayed anywhere very long. Um, had nothing with it to do with his ability to coach. Um, I, well, let, let me rephrase that. I don't really know how good a coach Lou was. But he was a tremendous communicator, and one of the one of the positive characteristics that I saw in Lou's ability to handle a football team was that he let his assistant coaches coach. Now, how many buttons were pushed and mashed in meetings prior to the practice field? I don't know. But um, he, um, he communicated extremely well with those assistant coaches. Why he, uh, why he moved around so much, uh, you know, I don't know. He's looking for another challenge, you know, somewhere down the road. Uh, how old was Lou when he passed away? 89? 80, late 80s? Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He had to be 87. Um, I visited with him on numerous occasions when we would go to Myrtle Beach. He told me at age 87 that he was ready to get back into the coaching game. Did I know of a position, you know, and he always liked uh, schools that might have hit the bottom to bring them back up. Numerous occasions, I say numerous occasions, on some occasions, he took uh, schools that had a new program. And then he coached in uh, a couple of uh, semi-pro leagues that uh, had a, a, a new program. So uh, he just kind of liked to coach. I don't know what his motivation was about uh, leaving a championship team, but he went to Maryland. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't even want to go there. He ended up in Denver and somewhere. Well, I think he was only in uh, Maryland for one or two seasons, and then he went to the Broncos, where he was, interestingly enough, reunited with Cookie. That's correct. That is correct. So Joe Collier takes over in 66 <coughs> and you had a 9-4-1 and one season and you lost out to KC at the end of the championship. Talk about that. Let's talk about Joe. Boy, he was a special guy. Two people that paralleled one another was Jack Kemp and Joe from the intelligence side and the way they approached the game. Um, Joe, Joe and Jack's character was, was really close in, in the thought process, uh, which, which actually, uh, made us pretty good because they, they really communicated well. Um. <clears throat> uh, Coach Collier was um, really respected as uh, Coach Saban's number one assistant guy. 
he was uh, he wasn't the head coach, but uh, you know, you knew that that uh, someday he would be, and you hoped that it would be with us, and it worked out, you know, that way. Uh, knew the game of football in and out. Um, that particular year, we, uh, we were not the best football team, uh, in the AFL. Although three weeks prior to that championship game that you mentioned, we beat Kansas city in Kansas city. And here we are going to play them in Buffalo and it's the first Super Bowl. The winner goes to the first Super Bowl. Uh, I couldn't have been um, any more ready for a game and than that one. And the thought process was that, you know, we just beat them three weeks ago. We got them here at home. It's the first Super Bowl. You know, nobody said this is a done deal. <laughs> But kind of thought that they beat us like thirty-one to seven, I think, something like that. We fumbled. There were, you know, Jack threw a couple of interceptions. Um, there was a uh, special team run back. I think we were down like twenty-one to nothing um, before uh, the dew got off of the ground. Uh, we never recovered. Now, one player from that era said that he thought that if Lou Saban had been the coach, he would have won that game. Oh. I, that's not my thought process at all. Um, we, uh, we just got beat like a drum. So 67 through 69 were, were years of transition and, and yeah. whatnot uh, and so on. And you and Jack both retired in 69. Mm-hmm. Talk about that sort of downslide. Well, um, there still wasn't a lot of uh, change in personnel. A lot of the same personnel was there uh, that was there in 64 and 65 and 66. Um, we had gotten older, or we're getting older. We had some bumps and bruises. Uh, our four seven forty time now was five flat. Just you know the way it is. The velocity of the arm on the quarterback was not what it was before. Uh, the speed of the receiver was uh, step floor. We we were. We were at that point in uh, in our football careers where uh, we were not as competitive as we had been in the past. Um, the new guys that uh, that joined us, um, quite frankly, were not uh, um, as competitive as the ones that they replaced. So combination of the two was a football team that uh, needed an infusion of some sort. <clears throat> well, there, quite a number of you retired in 69. You mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. um, did you discuss amongst yourselves mm -mm. we're going out? Mm -mm. I didn't. Um, my wife and I had made each other. My, my, my retirement had nothing to do with Jack or Stu or Al or uh, whoever else went out at that particular time. And my decision was a uh, collaborative um, agreement with my wife. We had talked, we made our home in Louisiana during the football off season. And we left Buffalo and went to Louisiana. And we have three daughters. And two of the girls had started school. 
and they would start school in the Buffalo area. And then after Christmas, depending upon how we did, would uh, start school in Louisiana, finish the year. Uh, honestly, the school that she went to in Buffalo was a little more advanced than the school in Louisiana. So she would be so far ahead when we got home and then so far behind the next year starting that, sh that the wife and I sat down and we said, you know, um, we, we don't want to take advantage of, of football, which we never did, but we're not going to let football take advantage of our family. And we really retired on that principle. Uh, I felt like I had two, three, four more years, you know, to play. Uh, I felt that way. Might not, have, might not have made it, but I felt that anyway. And, um, but, uh, but we retired. I, to carry that a step further, Houston, the, the Bills gave the Oilers, the Oilers lost both starting guards in 1970. Uh, in the first exhibition game. And the make a long story short, Houston got the Bills uh, permission to interview me. I went to Houston, talked to Houston. Um, I was offered more money to play three years than I'd made my whole career in Buffalo. So I'm all excited. I'm going to play for Houston. I go home and my wife says, why did we leave Buffalo? She says, a principal's involved. Yeah, you're right. So we didn't do it. Oh, retired. Why do you, how do you account for Jack Kemp having been around, I think, three or four NFL teams and never got much further than the taxi squad and came so quickly to ascension in the AFL? Um, I can't speak, to, you know, to Jack's presence with the Giants. Um, I don't even remember who the quarterback was. 1957 or 8? Was that Wyatt? Wyatt Tittle? Might have been. Yeah. Uh, well... That's one reason that he didn't play uh, a whole lot, uh, if that the case. Um, the AFL was ready for a lot of uh, marginal players. Not not that they were bad football players, but they were playing behind some exceptional football players and you know they were ready to play and and there were several guys that probably came into the AFL you know like that and then there were some that came into the AFL I think about a, a George Blanda that people thought that his career you know was on the tail end and he played for umpteen years after that um I don't think it has anything to do uh, with uh, the credibility of the player being less or, or in some cases being more in the other league. The, the timing, you know, was right for, for a new league. Do you look back on the AFL as a kind of golden era? I don't know that if it was, uh, Brian, if it was a golden era or not, but it was a, and, and, and I go back and think about what Coach Dodd, you know, told me in 1961. He could see that there was room for another leak and that there, there either was going to be two separate paths or there would be... Um, 
um, a merger. And of course, as we know, the merger happened. But the AFL was different. The Bills and Jack, you know, we were different than the AFL. We were more NFL than we were AFL. Uh, kind of a team because we ran the ball a whole lot more than we threw the ball during that uh, during that era and that's the way the NFL played now the real you know the San Diego for an example uh, they were a real true uh, AFL team in throwing the football Namath comes along AFL so yeah, it could be golden in that the timing was so perfect for a new league. Were you surprised when uh, A, Jack retired with you and then B, what his next step was to go into politics? No, no. no we, knew, we knew where he was headed from day one. We'd heard enough, you know, from day one. All the conversations on the airplanes and the conversations after practice, yeah, no doubt where uh, you know where Jack was headed, no doubt. You uh, said uh, somewhere that uh, Jack was always reading and always preaching. Well, he wasn't preaching gospel; he was preaching, you know, political uh, um, aspirations or the direction that we needed to go. Um, yeah, I mean, from day one, from day one, uh, he made a, he made a real impact on, um, on all of us because it's, you know, it's satisfying in a way to see a person advocate what he or she wants or is going to do or going to be long before it happens and then to see it you know come to life um, you know there's a fun experience um, he was called the senator some of the time right uh, I never called him that but um, I think media did. I, I don't know of a teammate that ever, ever called him senator. He uh, we might have called him president, but we didn't call him senator. <laughs> you, uh, he he tried to convince a lot of you to vote for Goldwater, didn't he? Absolutely. And did. And did, yeah. Gold Goldwater Reagan, were, uh, yeah. Was uh, were his uh, his choices back in the day, and uh, yeah, sure did. Did you grow up in a politically uh, active family, or did not? Did not. Politics was new to me. Um, one of the one of the few times that Jack and I ever had, uh, you know, disagreement. Um, I, I just, I hate to say it, but I didn't grow up in a politically motivated family. Uh, so the political motivation was not, um, just not important to me at the time. And um, so we talked about, you know, we talked about that. And, uh, you know, he, Jack has told me on several occasions, he said, you know, after football, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'll go into business. No, no. What are you going to do to help our United States, our state, or a county, are you going to get involved? And I says, probably not. And he says, why wouldn't you? He says, you know, you've, you've been a part of this team, so there is a name recognition. 
back in your part of the country, you know, um, nobody else has done that. So you should. And I said, nah, that's just, that's not me. So I decide to do it. So I call him and I said, um, I didn't want to tell you, but I ran for school board on a local level. He said, um, and I said, I got elected. He says, great. I says, but I ran as a Democrat. He's, <laughs> he, he didn't say anything for a, a little while. And then he says, that's okay. That's okay. He says, you know, one of these days you'll come around. That's okay. You made, you made the first step. <laughs> that was in that. <laughs> yeah. So we, we argued about, it. and my philosophy, you know, was that the guy that I ran against was, you know, Republican. So I, 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 I usually vote for the person, not not the party. So we talked about that. So you were reelected, weren't you? I um, I was reelected. Uh, let's see. I uh, I ran, got elected. It's a four year term. I ran a second for a second term, got elected, and then a third time. Uh, I ran and got beat. So, yeah. And have you remained a Republican, I mean a Democrat ever since? No, or? no. I, um, I'm a, I'm registered now as a Republican. So Jack won. <laughs> he didn't know it. <laughs> um, so fill us in on what else you did after, uh, after football. Uh, just work. You know, during, during my football career, and the reason that we lived in Louisiana is that um, my dad and I bought a machine shop and a steel fab business after, after my first year of pro ball. And it was in, in Mississippi, uh, Natchez. And we lived in across the river in Vidalia, Louisiana. Did that until 1973. Uh, Dad passed away, sold the machine shop. We moved to Georgia, and I got into the precast concrete business. And um, I worked for a company for four years in Atlanta, Stone Mountain area, and um, then decided that I could uh, do it on my own. So I built a plant and uh, make a long story short, I was in the business for 33 years and um, sold, uh, sold my plants a couple of times and um, uh, it was very good to me, very good to me. And where was the plant located? Had, um, had one plant, the very first plant that I built was right here in Tacoa. I serviced Atlanta, Asheville, Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia. That was my market area. Um, built a plant in um, Columbia, Tennessee. Uh, bought a plant in, Green, in uh, Gainesville, Georgia. Built a plant in Athens, Georgia. Uh, bought a plant in... Um, Atlanta, uh, Green Coast Springs, Florida, two plants in Texas. So oh, we just got all over the place. But during that time, you were living here in Tacoa. I did, and this was the school board that you served on. That here. is correct. That is correct. Um. So, let's talk about your induction into the Hall of Fame. Okay. And who introduced you? <laughs> well, uh, my presenter was uh, Eddie Abramoski, Abe, who was um, all of our trainer during um, our playing days. 
Abe uh, was the very first employee hired by the Bills, uh, 1960. He came from the Detroit team, as Buster did. And um, he served as the trainer for 40 something years. Uh, 92, 94, something like that. And um, I chose uh, I chose Abe to uh, be my presenter, uh, primarily because of the influence that uh, he had on me, keeping me healthy, giving me the opportunity to play, to build the credentials, to get where I was. And I just have to give him all the credit for that. And what about Jack? <laughs> uh, well, uh, until the day that uh, Jack left us, I don't think he ever forgave me for not having him uh, be my presenter. Jack and I were extremely close. Patsy and Joanne, extremely close. You know, I watched the kids grow up. He watched my kids grow up, so there was a real connection between Jack and myself. And you absolutely would think that I would uh, have Jack be my presenter. And the choice came down between Abe and Jack. There were other teammates that I felt really close to, that I felt would be slighted in uh, naming Jack. Abe meant so much to my career. So I really had I really had a tough dilemma. Um, Patsy and I talked about it. We prayed about it, and um, oh maybe a month before the induction, uh, it was just evident that uh, Abe was my choice. And how did you let know, Jack know? I called him. I, I kept him aware. I kept him aware of the process that I was going through, that I was uh, struggling, you know, with it. Um, he understood, but I don't know if he really understood. <laughs> but... Um, he was very complimentary, uh, and this is Jack and his graciousness. He was very complimentary in uh, my choice of uh, Abe. Did he attend the induction that he year? He did not. He, uh, he uh, emailed me. Uh, he, was, uh, he was in Colorado, you know, at the time. This was uh, 1999. Uh, he was he was in Colorado, you know. Didn't question it. I understood. And it never came up again between. Never the two came of you? up again. Never came up again. Um. So now talk a little bit about your effort to get him named to the Hall of Fame. Uh. I wrote a very um, personal uh, letter of recommendation. Um, Jack um, credentials, uh, stats as a quarterback are uh, uh, not uh, comparative. Uh, are competitive with uh, other quarterbacks that are in the Hall of Fame. So if you judge his uh, credential uh, and his uh, uh, worth just strictly on his stats, then uh, he doesn't have a chance going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But when you put all the stuff that Jack did uh, for football 
actually was the motivator behind the AFL uh, Players Association, uh, which he was president of five or six times. Um, his contribution to football is, uh, you know, more than Hall of Fame worthy. So when you put the two together, he very well qualifies as as a uh, an entity by himself. You know, the contribution side and the playing side, and. Um, one of the greatest honors that I had in, uh, in writing that letter. Um, you know, whether that ever happens or not, we'll wait to be seen. You remain the only strictly AFL player in the Hall of Fame, is that correct? That is not correct. I'm the only guy in the Pro Football Hall of Fame that never played a down in the NFL. I played my whole career in the AFL, so part of what you're saying is correct. But there are 33, 32 other guys in the hall that started their careers in the AFL and finished in the NFL. Right. Were you, uh, did you go to some of the Super Bowl parties that Jack held over the years? Yes. Um, Oh, gee. Um, maybe the last one was uh, the Bills. The Bills, um, 93. 93, the Bills played uh, Dallas and Atlanta. And um, uh, I, I went to that one. That was about the time that Jack had uh, presidential aspirations. And um, I want to make sure I was there to, you know, to help him at that point in time. You did support him in his uh, runs for the, for the presidency. Absolutely. I should say run, because it was really yeah, just 88. That's right. And then uh, did you do anything during the 96 campaign when he was the VP? Um, no. Not uh, not structurally, you know, assigned an assignment. But um, if I uh, if I saw you, he knew where I stood. So, yeah, and I was traveling a lot back in that time. I saw a lot of people. When what were your last contacts with Jack? Um couple of months uh, before he quit uh, uh, communicating. Um, don't remember what the conversation was about. Um, and he called me. But, you know, he... Uh, he won't talk to anybody right there toward the end, and so you tried to talk to him. Um, as um, I, 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 I did not call and try to talk to him directly. I, I can't remember if we talked to Joanne or not, uh, but um, I, I, I had talked to Rakowski. And uh, Eddie had talked, you know, had talked to him a lot. They were close, really close. And um, Eddie kept me abreast of, you know, health-wise where he was. How do you think he should be remembered? Jack? Um, better than average uh, football player? Um... Way better than average uh, politician. One of the greatest Americans that ever faced Earth. Good friend. 
Good for him? Good friend. Good friend. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Shall we stop there? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay.